Um, our speaker today, Joe Yuskinski, is an American political scientist currently working as an associate professor at the University of Miami. His work and research is most notably that on conspiracy theories and the American public, examining why groups buy into conspiracy theories. He received his bachelor's degree from Plymouth State University, his master's from University of New Hampshire, and his doctorate from the University of Arizona. In 2014, he published a book co-authored with Joseph Parent titled American Conspiracy Theories. As an MCSI fellow, we received this book prior to summer break, and I had a fascinating time reading it on my family's cruise vacation, specifically reading American Conspiracy Theories as I sunbathed on the Lido deck. I'm guessing I probably weirded out all the grandmas and preteens in my proximity with my choice of summer reading material. The hypothesis of his book and this lecture, Conspiracy Theories Are for Losers, examines the mentality and politics of believing in conspiracy theories in various social groups and political ideologies. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our wonderful afternoon speaker, definitely not a loser, Joseph Yuskinski. <laughs> Well, thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you, Brian, for having me out. Thank you, Pitzer. Thank you all for coming. I'm competing with a very gorgeous day out there, and because of that, I promise I will make this worth your while. Um, that's me. That's my information. Uh, she did not lie to you. Um, if you want to tweet along, that's my Twitter handle. You could say, I hate this talk, or I love this talk, and uh, whatever you want. If you want to see me on Facebook, or there's my website. Um, this is the title of the talk. Um, you guys are fairly tame. I was doing this talk across England this summer and I was getting protested at every single stop that I did. Um, and, you know, I define the term loser in my work not in a pejorative way, but in a descriptive way. So by loser, I mean somebody who's on the outside, somebody who perhaps is in a party that just lost an election, somebody who's not part of the mainstream. Um, and I guess I could say that in the theory, but it just doesn't have the ring that loser has. Um, and I'm more than happy to agitate people in order to get them to come to the talks, even if it is to protest, but it doesn't look like you're planning on protesting. Um, so, two things my mother told me never to discuss, um, religion and politics. I would add a third thing to that, and that's conspiracy theories. Um, politics and religion are difficult to discuss. If you don't believe me, when you go home next month for Thanksgiving break, wait till a couple of bottles of wine have gone down and then start talking about Trump or something like that. Um, if you really want to push the envelope, start bringing up a few of your favorite conspiracy theories and see what your extended family has to say about them. Um, my guess is you may not be invited back next year. Um, and the reason for that is fairly simple. You're not gonna change minds about politics, you're not gonna change minds about religion, and conspiracy theories touch on those two things. What is true, and who has power, and what are they doing with it when we're not looking? And those are things that people hold very sacred to them, so they're difficult topics to negotiate. So let's see if we can perhaps negotiate some of, some of that during this talk. So I'm gonna define two terms I'm gonna use for you. So the first is conspiracy, conspiracies are real. Uh, Watergate is a prime example. So a conspiracy is a group of people who act in secret for their own benefit and against the common good. And when I'm talking about conspiracy, I'm talking about big things like threats to our, our, our bedrock institutions. You know, like Watergate, we're gonna try to break into the other party. That's a threat to our bedrock institution of democracy. We're not talking about things like, I'm trying to knock over the 7-Eleven, or um, you know, the woman and her mistress try to uh, assassinate her cuckold husband. Okay, we're not talking about the smaller things. We're talking about the bigger stuff. Um, so Watergate's one example. The Tuskegee experiments are a second example. There, um, the government was injecting into the eyeballs and spines of African Americans and Guatemalan citizens syphilis and then not telling them for 50 years and letting them um, have all the side effects. And finally, they came out and apologized. Um, Iran-Contra is another example where they were trading, trading arms to hostile nations um, illegally. Now, a conspiracy theory in deference to that is a accusatory proposed explanation that invokes a conspiracy. So, 
in this case, many people think that JFK was killed by a conspiracy, perhaps one that has to do with Fidel Castro or the CIA or the Mafia or the Soviet Union or Lyndon Johnson. You take your pick. Everyone has their own villain in this one. But this is an accusatory perception, one that runs counter to the official wisdom, which is the uh, Warren report, which says, no, there was no conspiracy. So these ideas remain conspiracy theories. Um, the ones that are adopted by our official institutions, our knowledge-giving institutions, our conspiracies. So how many Americans agree with these uh, con different conspiracy theories that are out there? So about 60% right now believe in J some form of JFK assassination. This is actually a lower number than it was in the late 90s. It was almost 80% in the late 90s. Part of that was an X-File effect um, and, and the effect of the movie uh, JFK. And I'm proud to say that during the Oliver Stone JFK movie, they mentioned one university which was involved in the, in the uh, assassination, and that's University of Miami. So you have reason to suspect me of something right off the bat. 25% um, think that Barack Obama faked his birth certificate to illegally assert power. An equal number think that the Bush administration or the Jews or the Saudis uh, blew up the Twin Towers on 9-11. 21% think the military are hiding alien um, visits to Roswell, New Mexico. 20% think that pharmaceutical companies are hiding the true dangerous effects of vaccines. They may cause autism. 9% think that fluoride... Uh, uh, causes bad things to happen to you. Perhaps that it dulls you down and makes you ready to become a communist. Um, that's what some of them say. But uh, if you if you follow some of the Facebook pages for anti-fluoride activists, these are people you probably don't want to hang around with because they don't brush their teeth. Um, Six percent. Uh, believe that the moon landing was faked. And that's sort of interesting, because if you ask people, what are the big conspiracy theories you know, that, that come to mind when I say conspiracy theory, people will say, the moon landing. You know, it's popular as a conspiracy theory, but not popular in the sense that anyone really believes in it. It's very few people that, that think that was faked. 5% think that the lines you see in the sky that are left by airplanes um, are poison that are being put there in order to do population control. This one gets kind of cute. Uh, there's a video on YouTube of Prince before he died saying, you know, I know what, what's going on with those chemtrails and every time the plane would fly over that the stuff would come down and make us angry and it would injure us. Um, I don't believe that's true. And if you were ever going to poison a population of people, the absolute worst way to do it would be to put the poison 35,000 feet in the air. Because for the most part, it just goes out into the ocean. Um, so 5% of people think that. 4% of people, when we poll nationwide, think that we are ruled by a group of reptilian shapeshifters. Um, and I got kind of nervous because I got a sunburn last week, and I knew I was going to peel during the talk, and I was like, someone's going to accuse me of being a, a lizard person molting. And I can assure you that's not true. Um, these things matter. Um, these beliefs seem funny, like, ha ha, other people believe it, but they enter our politics um, in almost every issue. So if you think that 9-11 was a hoax, then you're going to think the airport security, you're going to think that uh, measures to monitor terrorism, you're going to think the war on terror is all a hoax to sap our freedom or, or part of some other plot. If you think the Mexican government is sending people here to rape and murder us, you're not going to be in favor of immigration policies um, that allow more people in. If you think the pharmaceutical company only makes drugs to make us sick and then profit back when they make us better with another drug, um, you're not going to like pharmaceuticals. If you think that uh, Monsanto is evil, you're not going to want to buy uh, GM food and you'll do all your shopping at, at Whole Foods. Um, if you think that the 1% secretly controls everything, you'll be into a different sort of tax policy than other people. Um, and the list goes on. If you think that the government's too big and run by shadowy bureaucrats, you'll think the deep state is out to get us. And if you think that communists have taken over you know, every college department, um, particularly the climatology departments on college campuses and the UN, then you're going to think that climate change is a hoax intended to bring about a new totalitarian society. Um, so these beliefs matter, and, and they, affect, they affect ultimate policy. During the Ebola scare of 2013, um, and this was shared half a million times on Facebook, 
um, people were freaking about about Ebola. There was a big outbreak in Africa, and this gets shared. It was pushed by Alex Jones' Infowars. It said that Africans were catching Ebola, dying, and then rising from the grave as Ebola zombies in search of brains to eat. Half a million times on Facebook. Now, luckily, this was not true, and because when we looked into it, we found that's not actually an Ebola zombie, but rather an extra from a Brad Pitt movie about zombies. World, World War Z, if anyone, if anyone remembers that one. So people get into weird, weird stuff. Um, right now, that's where I live. These numbers are actually, uh, um, if we were to update them, these numbers would be in the thousands, but we have a Zika crisis going on in South Florida right now. Um, people are very afraid of what's going on, and just as you have fears about vaccines, like the MMR vaccine having negative side effects that are being hidden, you have people thinking that not only will a va Zika vaccine be a hoax when it's developed, but they think the entire disease is a hoax, that it's been created um, for some nefarious purpose. So I did some polling on this. And when we asked people, you know, this is what the CDC says the cause of Zika is. You know, it's a disease uh, that was found in the 1940s. What do you think the cause of Zika is? And gave people a list that they can choose from. The four top answers that they gave were genetically modified mosquitoes, pharmaceutical companies, the government, and vaccines were the causes of the Zika virus. And what's so dangerous about this, and if you add these up, you've got about 20% of the population that thinks that. These are the things that are going to be used to cure the Zika virus. Vaccines, genetically modified mosquitoes distributed by um, pharmaceutical companies and the government. Um, we often see cycles of conspiracy. If you remember what they were saying about Hillary Clinton in the, um, during the last campaign, Trump started a rumor saying, you know, she's not fit enough to be president, she's physically unhealthy. So that led her to hide her illness when she actually did get sick. If you travel around for, you know, and shake everybody's hand, you're going to catch the flu. She did catch the flu, and at a 9-11 ceremony, um, they had to usher her into a van because she had passed out from the flu, and they gave her fluids, and she was fine. Of course, the Trump campaign comes out and says, you know, she's obviously dying, and then they had pictures of her afterwards where they say, this is a body double, not her. You could see the hips are differently shaped. Um, so what does she have to do? She goes on the Jimmy Kimmel show and to show that she's really spry and healthy and fit enough to be president, she opens up a pickle jar on the stage to show that she's strong. Okay, she does that. Then the next morning the conspiracy theory is the pickle jar was already opened. So you can't really win, but you see this, you see this idea where it's, you have the accusation of conspiracy driving people to certain action and then it leads to more conspiracy theories. Um, you, you have violence that sometimes spring from these beliefs. In December of last year, you had a man walk into a pizza shop in Washington, D.C. He was there to investigate with a loaded gun um, what he thought was a child sex ring, which he thought was hidden underneath the pizza um, establishment. He thought there was a, a secret train that would bring the children in to be molested. They would molest the children, kill them, and throw them in the pizza oven. This is very, you know, drawn out. He goes in with the gun, looks around, finds the door that's going to lead him to the secret chamber, opens it, and is very disappointed to find a mop closet. And luckily, he was arrested shortly after that. Um, but there are many examples like this where people get conspiracy theories in their head, and then they act on them in very deleterious ways. Robert Deere, who shot up the Planned Parenthood um, clinic uh, two years ago, he had a metal roof on his house and he encouraged his neighbors to do so to keep the government raised from coming in and stealing his, his thoughts. Um, there was a guy in Minneapolis who, luckily the FBI caught him in advance, but he was gonna go shoot up the Freemason temple because he believed that the Freemasons were involved in a conspiracy against Muslims. And uh, the Snarnev brothers um, who did the bombing at the Boston Marathon um, were 9-11 truthers too. So you wind up with a lot of examples of people committing violence based on conspiracy theories. So that's why they're important. So the question is, how can we explain this? And there have been a lot of previous answers. Almost any time you read about conspiracy theories, you will see this person show up. That's Richard Hofstetter. Um, 
so his idea is this, this is a psychopathology. You have people living out on the fringe. They just have weird ideas. There's something wrong with them. And he pointed to the John Birch Society, um, you know, people who are ultra far right. And that sort of set this academic tone for the last uh, 60 years where the idea is that conspiracy theories are largely, you know, on the domain of the right. Um, and that's, that may not be true. Um, other people think that, you know, conspiracy theories are just cognitive shortcuts. You know, the world is a messy place. I want to find something that's simple to explain events that are hard to explain. I don't think this is true, and the reason is that, you know, and I'll just give you one example. 9-11 conspiracy theories are far more complicated than 19 dudes with knives and box cutters pulling off an incredible stunt. I mean, if you look at some of the conspiracy theories online, they're incredibly complicated. So many, many people are not looking to simplify their thinking with conspiracy theories. Oftentimes, they make it much more, much more complicated. Some people say it's anti-Semitism or racism, but a lot of conspiracy theories really have nothing to do with this. Um, a lot of people say it's the internet that drives conspiracy theorizing. I would say it's been around long before that, uh, before the internet popped up. A lot of people like to blame the internet for everything, but we blame every new technology for everything. Um, and, and, and I think we just need to step back a little bit from those claims and just realize that some, some things that we blame technology for are just part of the human condition. Some people think social change drives conspiracy theories, and that was part of the Hofstadter's thesis. Not so much the case because there's always social change. So that, that doesn't get us very far. Some people think it's just conservatives. And I will try to prove to you it's neither conservatives or just political extremists. So three questions I'll answer. Why do people believe them? What are they for? And then what is conspiracy theory politics? Um, so my data come from three places. National surveys that I've been running over the last uh, five years. Um, to get a longer over time measure, I've looked at the letters to the editor of the New York Times, gathered a sample of about 1,000 letters per year from 1890 to 2010, had my graduate students read all 120,000 of them. That's what they looked like when they were done, because that was a lot of reading. And what we did with the letters is we looked at, we read every single one of them, picked out the ones that espoused or discussed a conspiracy theory, and looked at you know, what group was being accused of conspiring. And then just to look at the internet, I look at some Google Trends and Google Alerts data. Does anyone get this picture? <laughs> That's not supposed to be there. Um, so let me just start with a very broad question. Why do people believe in anything at all? So. You think about, it, we go out in the world, it's a messy place, how do we make sense of all the information that's coming in? Well, for any opinion, uh, the basic model that we have is any opinion is made of a new piece of information coming in laid over a predisposition that helps us interpret that new piece of information. So to give you one example, during the last month of the Obama administration, the jobs number came out, and it was holding steady about 4.7%. Democrats looked at that number and said, wow, Obama, when you came in, there was a massive recession. Now you're leaving, unemployment's way down. Thanks, Obama. Republicans looked at that, that exact same number and said that number's not picking up on what's really going on out there. And worse, that number may even be faked. Thanks, Obama. Same exact information, two very different interpretations. So it's not information that's driving you know, how we see the world. It's our underlying dispositions that drives most of it. The most important one that I deal with, because I'm a political scientist, is our partisanship. Partisanship is very sticky. Once it's sort of ingrained in us when we're 30, we're going to be that thing most likely for the rest of our lives. Some people change, but the majority of people don't. And we treat our party um, as if it's a tribe. My tribe is good. We're the good people. Even if we do something bad, well, we did it for the right reasons. But the other side. They're dodgy and they can't be trusted. And when they do something bad, it's because they're evil and they can't be forgiven. So very strong, um, very, you know, there's a lot of power in that predisposition there. So what winds up happening is that our predispositions drive us to seek out information in the world that matches what we already believe. So Republicans watch Fox, Democrats watch CNN and MSNBC. Um, we choose information environments that make us feel good. 
if you don't believe me, go out and, you know, if you're not a Republican, go put on Rush Limbaugh for a little while and see how you feel. You, you might be shaking. Or if you're a, a Republican, go watch Rachel Maddow. You know, you'll have a very stressed, tense feeling. And what you'll come to realize is that it's very easy for us to follow the things that tell us what we want to hear. So we wind up self-sorting to listening to what we want to. And in particular, we listen to partisan leaders. So Republicans listen to leaders on their side. Democrats listen to the leaders on their side. So that's where we get most of our um, opinions from. So just to give you a few examples of how powerful this is, uh, when Barack Obama decided that he was in favor of gay marriage, a lot of people were worried about whether the black um, community would follow him in that because the polls showed that African, Amer African Americans were actually the group that was most against gay marriage in the country. So they thought, will they turn against him because of this? And what they found was once Barack Obama changed his mind, so did the black community. And you see a massive change in their opinions on gay marriage. Um, there's a great experiment done on Trump voters before the election where vote, people who wanted to vote for Trump were told one of three things. Trump wants to keep the minimum wage the same. Trump wants to lower it. Trump wants to raise it. No matter what condition they were told, they went along with it. And that's funny because as Republicans, they should be like either get rid of the minimum wage or keep it the same but not raise it. But no matter what they were told, they would go along with it. There's a really great uh, comedy sketch that was done on Hulu with Triumph the Insult Comic Dog where they set up a, uh, a little round table of, of, of Trump voters that they found at a mall. So they don't know that this is fake. And they bring them in and they say, here are some ideas that Trump came up with and we want to see what you think about them. One of them was to put chips in the necks of Mexicans so that, that we could then trap them in porta potties and then ship them back over the border. And the people at the round table said, yeah, we think that's a pretty good idea. Another one was to deal with the transgender bathroom issue that they were gonna put loaded guns and bats in women's bathrooms so that they could protect themselves from the transgender threat. And the people at the round table, that sounds like a really good idea. So no matter what they were told, they said this sounds like great. Now, both of these ideas are absolutely horrid ideas, right? Like horrible. But when they were told your leader wants to do this, they say, yeah, that sounds okay. Um, this is my state, Florida, but the exact opposite thing happened here a few years ago um, when legalizing marijuana failed. Um, they had an initiative to make medical marijuana legal in Florida three years ago, and it was polling 80%, and it had to get 60. And what happened was a billionaire uh, casino mogul named Sheldon Adelson gave a bunch of money to Republicans in Florida you know, he's trafficking in booze and gambling, but I guess pot is just a step too far for him. Um, so he gave money to Republicans to come out and run a campaign against it. And they said, don't let Florida go to pot. All of a sudden, whew, Republicans changed their mind on medical marijuana, and it failed. The exact same thing happened here, I think, five or six years ago um, when it didn't pass when it didn't pass here, but it was Democrats who had changed their mind on it, and then the... the uh, uh, Democratic voters pulled their support from it, too. But perhaps my favorite example of this comes from this guy, Herman Cain. He ran for the Republican nomination for president in 2012. Um, his claim to fame was that he had previously been a successful CEO of Godfather's Pizza. It just so happened that during the time he was running, his former employer was doing a brand satisfaction survey. And they were asking a sample of Americans every week, you know, what do you think about Godfather's Pizza? Now, as the campaign went on and people started to associate Cain with Republicans and Godfather's Pizza, what we found was that Republicans started to like the pizza more and Democrats started to like the pizza less. Of course, it's the same freaking pizza, but people changed their mind on it because they had this cue going on. Um, so the way I think about conspiracies is that or conspiracy theory belief is that just as partisanship drives us to have specific opinions, um, I think that people also have this other predisposition, which I'll call conspiracy thinking, which then drives them to adopt specific conspiracy beliefs. So just as Republicans will adopt Republican beliefs, Democrats will adopt Democrat beliefs, people who think in conspiratorial terms are more likely to adopt conspiracy theories than um, people who don't engage in so much of that thinking. So just to, to measure conspiracy thinking, I gave people three statements. 
um, and you know, ask them on a, on a scale, how true do you think these are, from definitely true to, to, to definitely not true. Our lives are being controlled by plots hatched in secret places. We live in a democracy, but only a few people ever run things, and the people who really run the country are not known to the voters. So I, I got our survey respondents to, to answer these questions, put them together into one measure, and I called it conspiracy thinking. And that's essentially what it looks like, is most people sort of show up somewhere in the agree, neither agree nor disagree area. Um, and what this measure winds up predicting is their belief in specific conspiracy theories, how many groups they think are out to get them. So for example, people on the high end of the scale, I say, here's a list of groups. How many do you think are conspiring against us right now? The people on the high end of the scale picked five groups. People on the low end pick one group. If you think five groups are out to get you, you're not going out at night. Um, so you see this, this big disparity between, um, between people. So if I was to ask you right now, you know, to close your eyes and just think for a minute, what's the character of, of the prototypical conspiracy theorist? What does that person look like? Does anyone want to tell me what they think that person is? What color are they? White? Overweight, maybe, yeah. Middle-aged? Perhaps. Okay, politics? Libertarian. Libertarian, maybe. But probably probably more conservative, perhaps free market, yeah. So white, male, middle-aged, conservative. Um, sounds like me, I'm not balding though. Um, but those guys, he's balding, we know that, and he definitely is. So there's sort of this character that this is what they're like, but in fact what the data tell us is a very different story, um, is that conspiracy thinking cuts evenly across male and female, um, it, it cuts across race, it cuts across age, partisanship, and ideology perfectly um, equally. Um, so just to give you an example, the popular daytime show that's uh, hosted by women, largely targeted at women, The View, almost every host on that show espouses conspiracy theories. Jenny McCarthy espouses vaccine conspiracy theories. Whoopi Goldberg thinks the moon landing was faked. And Rosie O'Donnell thinks that jet fuel can't melt steel. So she's a 9-11 truther. The better predictors of conspiracy thinking are wealth and education. The more educated and the more wealthy you are, the less likely you are to think in conspiratorial terms. Why that is, I don't know yet. I mean, the causal direction could be going in either direction. Could be the case that if you're hiring a CEO for a Fortune 500 company and someone comes in and says, hey, I think lizard people rule the world, you're not gonna hire that person. Um, so it could be that these people are being kept out. It could be, on the other hand, that they're choosing not to um, um, enter certain arenas. So if you don't like the establishment, if you think it's a scam, then you're likely not going to get more educated and you may not be um, able to get into those higher paying jobs. Um, other characteristics. So the people who really think in conspiracy terms, their politics tend to be uh, um, third parties, tend to have a lot of conspiracy thinkers in them. Green Party um, is, is one example. Not so much the Libertarian Party, but some of them do. Um, but the politics are that, the, that people who think in conspiratorial terms are less likely to volunteer for a campaign, less likely to register to vote, less likely to vote. Um, they just don't want to take part. Same thing in economics. People who think in conspiratorial terms don't invest in the stock market, even controlling for wealth. If you think it's all rigged, you're not going to take part. And they are slightly more accepting of violence when we ask in surveys. Um, so that does, it does sort of match what we, uh, you know, what, what we see out there. Um, when we ask people, who do you think is conspiring against us, Republicans and Democrats, like a mirror image, point fingers at each other. So there we see uh, Democrats in blue think that corporations and conservatives are conspiring against us. And Republicans in red think that communists and liberals are out to get us. Mirror images, both pointing fingers at each other. Um, and we, we see this. So the 9-11 so the, uh, the truther theory believed mostly by Democrats. Almost 40% of Democrats believe that. Uh, almost 40% of Republicans believe that Barack Obama faked his birth certificate. And when, when, so when we poll on that, again, we see this mirror image. Republicans believing in the birther theory, Democrats believing in the truther theory. 
Independents buying into both, but only but, but a little bit less. Now, if we think of this in two dimensions, um, we can sort of explain why political uh, conspiracy theories spread and how many people um, they're able to attract. So if you think of one dimension, Democrats to Republicans, you have your left to right dimension. But then a second dimension, people who really think in conspiracy terms and people who, who are less likely to do so, um, what you find is that you know, your Democrats or high conspiracy thinkers think the Bush regime engineered 9-11, and the Republicans who think in conspiratorial terms believe that Barack Obama faked his birth certificate. Both of these cap out at about 25% at their apex. So the good news is a partisan conspiracy theory maxes out about 25%. The bad news is you have 50% of the population believing in one of these two. Okay, so there's good and bad news there. We hope that generally you know, some of those ideas prevail. Um, but wait, you ask, what about that Kennedy conspiracy theory that had 60%? Why is that able to garner so much? And this funny headline kind of tells us why. Um, given the number of villains that have been proposed, there should have been 800 bullets shooting at this guy while he was driving around. Um, when people poll, uh, or, or when polling houses poll on Kennedy, they always ask, do you think there was a conspiracy? And everyone comes up with their own conspiracy theory and their own villain, and that's why you get such a high number. But when you drill down a little bit and say, who do you think pulled the trigger? Was it the mafia? Was it LBJ? You wind up with much smaller agreement on each of those. Um, just like partisanship operates that way, there are other um, ideologies that we have that do the same thing. So. It, it, how many of you are familiar with uh, Da Vinci Code, Dr. Robert Langdon? Um, so the idea here is that Jesus had children with Mary Magdalene, and those children went on to be the Merovingian kings of France or something like that. Um, so the people who tend to believe these Da Vinci Code theories um, are people who buy into like new wave, you know, new age ideologies, people who have alternative ideas about religion, mysticism. Um, if you're that person, you're not so much into the, into the Jesus had children idea. So, um, other ideologies drive this. This is one, I'm actually originally from New Hampshire, and this is one that sort of speaks to, um, to my football team. So there was this controversy called Deflate Gate. There was a game that the New England Patriots won where there was an accusation that the quarterback, Tom Brady, had deflated the balls um, before the game, which would make them easier to catch. Um, and this went all the way through several courts and it went through federal court and Tom Brady, they actually upheld his suspension, but it was a big deal and it was all sorts of conspiracy theories going on. Um, was Brady hiding something? Was the NFL hiding something? But anyway, um, so who believed that Brady had conspired to deflate the balls? I mean, every, everybody outside of New England thought that he had cheated. So everywhere they played, you're a cheater. Um, but when he was at home in New England, where I'm from, they thought his balls were perfect. So depending on where you're from and depending on what your other views are, these are all Patriots fans here, they think that he didn't do anything wrong. Everyone else, he's guilty. Um, and that explains a lot about people. So what about, you know, what about the internet? So people like to blame the internet for everything and conspiracy theories are no different, but there's no evidence right now that, cons that belief in conspiracy theories has increased due to the internet. That evidence may come along, but we have yet to see it. There are millions of conspiracy theories that pop up on the internet, but that itself tells you that the internet is a very hostile place to conspiracy theories. Because I, I look at the conspiracy theories every day on Twitter, and they're here today, and they're gone tomorrow with the wind. Most of them just disappear right into the night without attracting many likes or retweets. So it's not like, you know, you read about in some news articles where they say, they go on the internet and everyone shares them. No, it's just not true. Um, most die. When you look at web traffic, even the biggest conspiracy websites like Infowars don't even come close to, to the Washington Post or the New York Times. So the last time I checked, InfoWars was ranked 321 in the US in terms of web traffic. You know, the New York Times was in the top five. And I think there was about 250 porn sites in between those two. So people are going to the internet to do all sorts of things before they're going to, to, to look at conspiracy theories. Um, 
and there's another way to look at the effect of the internet too now. We don't always take a, account that we now have access to authoritative sources. You know, when I was a kid and I get sunburn, you know, my grandmother would use village wisdom to cure my sunburn and that would involve rubbing butter on me. Don't do that. That's terrible. I mean, that's the best village wisdom, but now you can Google, should I put butter on somebody? Well, it says no. You know, and you can hear direct information from dermatologists that say exactly what to do when you get a sunburn. And you find that in politics and medicine. In anywhere, there's so much expertise available on the internet now, you don't have to follow conspiracy theories or made up, you know, village beliefs. Um, so that should be working in the opposite direction. Ideology still filters what we believe. So it's not like, you know, we go to the internet and find stuff that we're not looking for. If I don't like conspiracy theories, I don't go looking for them. And if I don't like left-wing stuff, I don't go to left-wing websites. So people look for what they want to look for. And for the most part, elites really still drive beliefs. You know, yes, it's absolutely true that there's tons of conspiracy theories lurking around in the dark corners of the internet, but nobody's going there. And you can Google anything and fi find a ton of, you know, find a ton of hits. Go Google duck confit recipe. You will find more than half a million hits, but no one's going home to cook duck confit tonight. Just like there aren't tons of people looking for conspiracy theories. So it's not the panacea that some people have made it out to be. So one hypothesis that's often put out um, with the internet is that, is that there's implicitly this hurting behavior that goes on. So that somebody puts a conspiracy theory onto social media, people see it and then just start indiscriminately spreading it. So just like when uh, cattle start running, the other cattle start running too. So you would see herd behavior. The question is, do we find that with conspiracy theories? Now we do find it with things that aren't conspiracy theories. And just to look, this is a measure of people looking up mindfulness on Google over time. So you see, mindfulness became a thing and some people got into it and then more and more and more and more and more, and more, and more people. So you see this herding behavior take place. And mindfulness was sort of one of those new ideas that came out, wasn't very well evidenced. It might be now, but at the time it was fairly dubious. So you can see that ideas can gain traction. Um, another one that popped up was colon cleanse. And, and you could see the same exact curve. You know, you have some people get into colon cleanse and then it spreads and people think, oh, this is a great idea. Um, but you don't find that with conspiracy theories. Instead, what you find is a complete elite-driven thing. So this is... Obama's birth certificate, and you don't see herding behavior. What you st tend to see instead is elite-driven um, spikes here. And here you have the media talking all about the birth certificate right before the election in 2008. Here you have Trump talking about it in 2011, and if I was to go two months more here, you would see a spike right before the 2016 election when Trump and, and Hillary Clinton started talking about it again. So conspiracy theories, particularly partisan ones, are really driven by, you know, by elite sources, um, like here. So what are conspiracy theories for? Um, I'll just read this to you very briefly. So conspiracy theories, if you were to talk, talk about who's going to be accused and when will those people be accused, Conspiracy theories are used by vulnerable groups to manage dangers. They are early warning systems to keep watch over sensitive areas and prepare solutions to potential attacks. At their bottom, conspiracy theories are threat perception. They're about fears that are driven by shifts in power. And because defeat and exclusion are their biggest inducements, conspiracy theories are for losers. So to test that, we looked at our letters to the editor data and we got, this is what all the conspiracy letters over time look like. So right and left, equal number of letters, capitalists and communists, near equal number of letters. Americans love to accuse foreigners and foreign governments of conspiring against us. And if you think about Trump's strategies with conspiracy theories, he could not have picked a better mantra because Americans are always afraid of other countries. Um, so going out, talking about ISIS and immigrants and Mexicans, um, just played right into what many people already already feared. If you're to look at this data over time, what you find is that in the years when a Republican is president, most of the conspiracy theories focus on conservatives, Republicans, the wealthy, and big corporations. 
And you find the opposite. When a Democrat's president, most of the conspiracy theories focus on communists, socialists, and Democrats. So our fears shift back and forth. And this matches our recent experience. During the Bush administration, we were afraid of Bush, Cheney, Halliburton, Blackwater, war for oil. And then those things became politically inert as soon as Obama won. And then it was the birth certificate, and Obama killed the kids at Sandy Hook, and he blew up the Deepwater Horizon well, and he's a socialist and a Muslim and a Satanist. And those things don't matter anymore. And now it's Trump Russia, and Trump is doing this, and Trump is doing that. So the things that we care about follow changes in relative power. And not just the presidency, but also Congress, too. During the two years that Democrats controlled everything, 2009 and 2010, Republicans were going crazy with conspiracy theories. And as soon as they took back the House, a lot of the air was let out of that balloon. Same thing, same thing happened in 2006 when the Republicans controlled everything and then lost the House to the Democrats. Air was let out of that balloon. If the Democrats were to win back the House or the Senate, most likely some of the conspiracy theorizing um, is going to go down on their side because they will have gained relative power. Um, you also find during major wars, World War I, World War II, and the Cold War, you people are much more concerned about foreign threats than they are during other times. Um, so conspiracy theories are really a bellwether of fear. What are we afraid of at any time? And it seems like the American public is pretty good at putting their fears on things that are actually powerful. We were never afraid of Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan or Korea. We were afraid of Russia, and we were afraid of Germany in World War II. So let's take this and apply it to voting. Um, so in 2012, right before the election, I did a poll. I asked people, do you think that the outcome um, will be fraudulent? And both sides, Republicans and Democrats, equally said, you know, equal numbers said yes. After the election, Obama wins. Democrats, when asked, do you think there was fraud involved? No, it was perfect. Republicans, we were cheated. And when you ask what kind of um, fraud was taking place, Republicans think that bribery and fake ID is a fraud that is going on, and that makes sense. This is why they want I, this is why they want ID checks um, during voting. Oh, excuse me. For Democrats, they think it's suppression and intimidation. So both sides are pointing fingers at each other, and this matches what they talk about. Democrats think that their that their people aren't being allowed to vote, and Republicans think that people who shouldn't be allowed to vote are being allowed to vote. So it's just the fingers, again, going back at each other. If you ask people about more recent elections, 37% uh, Republican, of Republicans think that Ohio was rigged in 2004. An equal number think that ACORN rigged the election for Obama in 2012. The funny thing was um, ACORN didn't exist in 2012, but Republicans believe they did it anyway. Um, so, so parity between the two beliefs. Beliefs about fraud, just a little bit different in 2016, and the reason is because fraud became an actual issue in the election with the Trump campaign saying, yes, fraud happens all the time. It's going to be completely prevalent, and Democrats having to come out and say, no, fraud does not happen. So you wind up with a little bit more Republicans than Democrats thinking fraud is going to happen in 2016, but afterwards, a lot of air gets let out of the Republicans' balloon, um, and they don't think that it was fraudulent. YouGov did a poll of Democrats um, a couple weeks after the election, and they said, do you think the Russians hacked the voting machines? Of course, there was no evidence that this had taken place. 50% of Democrats said yes, and that this has happened. So now it's the Democrats whose beliefs are going up, and nobody makes a better example of this than Paul Krugman. He's a you know, Nobel, Nobel Prize winner, uh, writes for the New York Times. And here's his tweet in 2006. Many of the people who throw around terms like loopy conspiracy theories are lazy bullies. In 2006, he was on the losing side. He was in favor of the conspiracy theories because that was a tool that his side was using. And he, the establishment who was working against conspiracy theories, he didn't like that. He thought conspiracy theories were okay. But the Democrats take charge and Obama's president, then he changes his tune. Conspiracy theories are supported by a lot of influential people on the right, but not on the left. We would never believe in conspiracy theories. And then Trump wins, 
and then he comes out with the conspiracy theories. Um, Putin and Comey work together to swing the election. So depending on where you are, you know, um, in terms of relative power, that drives your view of conspiracy theories and if you believe in them or not. Um, and because conspiracy theories are losers, once Trump won, this was okay. Jill Stein came out and raised $8 million in just a few weeks to do a recount with the support of the Clinton campaign. They alleged that, that some of the voting machines potentially had been hacked in some uh, voting districts, particularly in Wisconsin. Um, $8 million raised very quickly. The same time that's going on, he says this, I won the Electoral College fair and square, but I would have won the popular vote if not for those three million illegal Mexicans who had voted. Um, this didn't work, because he was no longer a loser. And this, got, this agitated a lot of people, and they said, oh my god, he's destroying democracy. But this sort of flew under the radar, and it was okay, because they're on the losing side. Now the irony is that Jill Stein, who raised money for the recount, is now being accused of being a Putin agent, and that people think that she threw the election. Um, Brexit, you sort of see the exact same thing um, t taking place, where you had people on the outside, people who didn't like the EU, and they said, hey, you know, um, you better vote in, in uh, pen, because if you vote in pencil, they're going to erase your vote. And these people were driven by fears that the EU was starting a secret army, and that there was secret plans for more integration coming that they didn't want. So, again, we're not the only country that has had conspiracy fears drive some of this. So democracy demands the power change hands from time to time, and that means everybody gets to play the winner and everybody gets to play the loser. So eventually everyone will savor the sweet righteousness of the prosecution before drinking the very, very bitter draft of being persecuted. Conspiracy theories are like an insurance plan. We all pay in, and then we get to get the payout eventually. So what we've seen more recently is what I would like to call conspiracy theory politics. You had two candidates that based their campaigns largely on a conspiracy theory. Trump, if you boil all of his stuff down to one thing, all these conspiracy theories, it basically comes down to foreign elites, um, it basically comes down to the idea that political elites in America have sold out the interests of regular Americans to foreign interests. For Bernie Sanders, it was that political elites have sold out the interests of regular Americans to economic elites, which he called the 1%. Both of them think th thought that everything was rigged. Trump thought the elections were going to be rigged. Bernie Sanders said that our entire political and economic systems were rigged. They both got 40% of their vote. The establishments, on the other hand, aren't very good at conspiracy theorizing. It's just not what establishments do, but you did see a little bit of conspiracy theorizing coming out. Some people on the Republican side thought that Trump was a Clinton plant there to screw up the Republican Party so the Clintons could win. Um, Hillary Clinton thought that people were attacking her and it was part of the vast right-wing conspiracy coming back to get her again. Um, so the question is, why did it work for them? Why were they able to get 40% of their respective parties' votes? So one thing I'd like to propose is, you know, take a look at this office. It's a nice group of people working in an office. Now let's say one of them has a bunch of really crazy ideas that they, wanna, they might want to share with others. Because by sharing their ideas, they can engage in collective action. But let's say those ideas are a little bit off the mainstream. Like, I don't think a black person should be president. You can't really come out and say that because you'd be ostracized from, from an environment such as this. So you might say something like, hey, did you hear about that birth certificate thing? Maybe it's faked. Who knows? I don't know. Or did you hear about that Pizzagate thing? So you can come off sounding like a kooky conspiracy theorist without having to share something that could get you socially ostracized. So it may very well be the fact that not only are people believing in the conspiracy theories, um, but they are signals for some other deeper ideology that's off the beaten path that may not be able to ex be expressed so openly. So one way you can, one thing you can liken that to is like drugs, like street gangs. If you want to join a, a street gang, you have to make a serious commitment. So here, this guy's got his whole face tattooed up, and that pretty much means he's in the gang for life. 
He's not going to switch to another job. He's made us pretty strong commitment. If we were to join the mafia now, generally what they make you do is shoot somebody first. That way they know you're not, um, you're not an FBI agent. They also know that you're pretty fairly committed once you're already killing people. Um, same thing with radical leftist groups back in the 1970s where they wanted people to join. They would invite them and their spouse to share in like sex orgies. And once they did that, they would know they were fairly committed to the group. Um, because once that person does that, they can't really transition into that. So it's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty strong thing. So to me, the conspiracy signal, you know, may very well mean something that's going on underneath. And they're finding this out right now with Brexit voters where the people who believed in Brexit conspiracy theories also believed that, you know, we, you know, it's bad to have women in the workplace, gays shouldn't be getting married. So there are other, you know, beliefs that, that might be underlying this. Um, one thing I like in it too, and I know the movie's coming out, the My Little Pony movie, um, but bronies. Here you have a group of people that are espousing something that comes off very outside and may very well be a marker for other ideas and behaviors that might be that might be strange. So um, you have you have the two candidates. Bernie is able to get forty percent, but because he's up against one candidate, he's not able to win. Um, Trump did because the establishment vote on the Republican side was divided twenty ways. Trump wins by putting together a coalition of people who were sort of motivated by conspiracy theorizing. Now, the interesting thing is, like, if you look back at one episode, after Trump secures the nomination, he comes out that day and says, I think Ted Cruz's dad killed JFK. And the Washington Post ran an article that said, we don't even know how to cover this. There was no reason for him to say that. It's just loopy. And he had, no, he had no need to do it because he had won. So why are you attacking the guy's father? Part of the reason is, as I mentioned earlier, conspiracy theorists are less likely to vote. But by pushing this conspiracy narrative over and over and over and over again, he was able to motivate those people. And you see a lot of people casting ballots for the first time for Trump in a lot of these states. So he was able to use the conspiracy theorizing to motivate people who otherwise might not have voted. Now, where does that leave us? Conspiracy theorists are sometimes deft at getting power, but power is a greasy pole. And keeping together a coalition of conspiracy theorists once you're in power is sort of difficult. It's not easy for the most powerful person on the planet to say they're a victim of shadowy forces. So the narrative may not work for that long, and he may have to rebrand himself. So normally I like to end my talks with, you know, a beautiful picture of the world and I'd say something very uplifting to you, but you could sort of see the hurricane brewing and it's sort of a strange place to be in. You know, I don't think that people are believing in conspiracy theories more now than they have in the past. What I do think is that they are much more part of our political discourse than they ever were in the past. And I think that's a particularly bad thing. Um, conspiracy theories are fine. There is another part of the ledger. But sometimes they can lead to such extreme distrust um, that they can damage the politics. And I think that may very well be where we are right now. If I could give you any advice, any advice, be open-minded. And when presented with conspiracy theories, try to treat it the same way you would any other belief. Just don't buy it because it implicates the other side or doesn't implicate yours. Thank you so much for having me.